All right, well, good morning, everybody. Um, so, I'm Jeff. And uh, I'm just going to give you an update on what's going on at Zojo. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Christian and Monkey Bread Software for putting on this conference. It's really great. Uh, I, I was realizing the other day that of all of Europe, I've been to Germany far more than any other country. Uh, I've been to, let's see, um, Heidelberg. Um, I've been to Berlin, Munich, Cologne, and now oh, and Frankfurt, <laughs> and, and now uh, Andernach, which I thought was pronounced Andernash. Uh, the people on the train were really confused when I was saying Andernash. I don't know where that is. Yeah, anyway. So, um, yeah, so I got a bunch of stuff to go through. Uh, if you have questions, uh, just, you know, save that for the end. I'll have a, a little bit of time at the end to answer questions. Um, I know that it can sometimes be stressful wondering what I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> so to alleviate that stress, uh, I'm, I won't be announcing any name change to the products. <laughs> Uh, and, and I won't be announcing API 3. <laughs> so now you can just relax and everything will be fine. Okay. So uh, I want to review quickly what, uh, what happened in 2023. Uh, we fixed 581 bugs. That's actually, our average per year is about 500, as it turns out. It's surprising how consistent that number is. It's always right around 500. Uh, but, but last year was 581, so that was great to see. Uh, we had 132 new features, and I want to just touch on a couple of the, the most notable ones. Uh, the chart control, which Javier worked on, which is really great. Um, we have desktop version, and we modeled this after the chart control for the web, so it, it's pretty much exactly the same, Javier, is that correct? I mean, it's yeah, basically exactly the same. Um, which is great. All, if you haven't used it, all the different kinds of charts possible are there. Uh, mobile as well, or for iOS, I should say. And we brought Android to beta. So uh, we, still, we still call it beta. Probably sometime this summer, the beta label will go away. There's certain things that we want to make sure are available um, in Android before we s decide that it's no longer beta, but it's still considered beta. Uh, the desktop XAML container, for those of you doing Windows, uh, it gives you access to a whole plethora of controls, uh, and these are all the modern look and feel for Windows 11. And I'll actually be coming back to that in a bit. Dark mode for the web. Uh, so we now support dark mode for the web. If you haven't uh, played with this, remember that Existing projects, you have to turn it on, right? It's not on by default, whereas when you make a new project, it is. So uh, I opened up a couple of web projects, and why is it in dark mode? Oh, right, <laughs> got to actually set that feature for, uh, for older projects. We brought a PDF viewer for iOS, which is really great for viewing PDF files. Uh, geofencing. So if you haven't looked at the iOS location class, it now supports geofencing, <laughs> which this is one of those features where uh, once you have a, a need for it, you suddenly are grateful it's there, right? Because it's actually really easy to use and you can do some pretty amazing things when you can make your application respond differently based on where the device is. Um, that's, that's really cool stuff. Uh, and we have zip and unzip now for a folder item, which is really great. We did some optimizations last year. Uh, we made the IDE more responsive. And th this is one of those places where it's, you know, we really do, the term in English is we eat our own dog food, right? Um, the engineers use the IDE all day long. So when they run into something that's, you know, not optimal for them, well, they want to fix it. <laughs> so uh, so a, a lot of these optimizations were the result of that. Uh, we made building faster. We made debugging faster. Uh, web apps got more responsive in 2023. And plugins are loading faster now. We also added barcode support for Android. And a personal favorite of mine, we made the ID examples searchable. 
So if you haven't looked at this, when you go to examples, you can just type in a keyword at the top and it filters them all you know, based on that keyword. We've got information now stored so that we know each example's, uh, uh, the type of example is desktop, mobile, et cetera, what platforms it supports, a description. So you can search on these things. And I didn't show it in the screenshot, but there's a filter. So if you wanna look at just test desktop examples, you can filter out just those. Um, so it's really convenient. Before, with examples, you really had to just spend a lot of time sort of example spelunking, you know, uh, kind of digging around through the examples. But now you can just search and, and find what you're looking for. All right, so that was a quick review of 2023. So next I wanna talk about databases. Um, so database applications are sort of the meat and potatoes of uh, a lot of developers' work. You know, it, it, it's very common to be writing applications that talk to some database, especially if it's in a business environment. And uh, databases are near and dear to my heart. I've been building database applications my entire adult life. So I wanna make them better. And one of those areas is in connecting to the database. It's the first thing you do, right? Connect to a database. Um, so right now, you probably mostly do that by code, uh, but this is another area where we felt like we could make this no longer require code. So I wanna give you a quick demo of something we're working on for that. Uh, let's see. All right, so I'm gonna make a new desktop project. Oh, whoops. There we go, okay. New desktop project. And basically your choices in the past were to uh, connect with code, right? Or we had this um, database object that you could add to your project. And the downside to this was that you could only pick one database server or one database file and that was it. Right, and you didn't have a lot of control over it. So we've added a new type, a database connection. So I can pick a server, I can pick SQLite, and when I do that, it adds this object to the navigator, and you can expand this, and you can choose a database for each stage of your development. So you could actually have uh, a database you personally use for development, another one for alpha testing, yet another one for beta testing, and even a final, another one for final. So, for example, you might have a group of beta testers and you have a separate database server just for them, right? Or, and a separate database server that you use that you know you can destroy all the data and rebuild it and all that <laughs> stuff. And then, an, and then a, a, another database that's just for your end users when you actually ship, right? So, the idea here is you pick one, you can then configure it in the inspector, and you know, obviously if it's a server, you can have different IP addresses and, and sort of things like that. Um, so for example, I'm doing SQLite, so I'm gonna go to the desktop and pick a database. Okay, and now I can connect to that. I can uh, you know, view the tables and um, columns and stuff. So I can reference those right there in the IDE and um, one of the features it has is that it, it, it can connect on launch, so it automatically connects to the database, and there's a, the stage. You can pick the stage or leave it on automatic. Now, if you leave it on automatic, then as you change your stage code when you build, it will automatically pick the right matching database to connect to. So it's just set it up and forget about it because it's just gonna work the way you'd expect it to. Now, um, so yeah, so that's database connections. Um, it, it's much more flexible. Uh, one less thing you have to write code for, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, let's see, so now, I do that. Oh, and then, okay, there we go. All right, so I don't know if you've seen this, but we've got an example uh, that um, shows off a set of classes I wrote uh, called dbkit. Uh, it's something I've been working on and the goal of dbkit is basically just to reduce, oops, I gotta switch glasses here. There we go. 
um, reduce the um, amount of effort it takes to build a front end to a database. Um, if you've built a front end to a database, it's not complicated code, you know, queries and getting the data out of a row set and getting it into the user interface and then when the user makes changes, getting it back into the database, right? But it's just kind of um, grunt work, right? It's not interesting code to write, it's just boring stuff you have to write. So my goal with dbkit is to make it so that I can reduce the amount of code that you have to write to build a database front end. So I wanna show you this. You may have seen it on your own. I've actually done some uh, new work. Uh, I'm gonna show you some things that I haven't released yet. Um, but if you've not played with dbkit, this will give you a really good idea of what it's capable of. All right, so let's see. Okay. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. I've got this database connection. I'm gonna go ahead and use that. Um, so first thing I'm gonna do is I need to copy dbkit into my project. So I've got it open here. I'm gonna copy the icons that it uses and dbkit itself. So anytime you're gonna use dbkit, you can just go to the example. Uh, if you go to the examples and go to databases, it's right there. Open it up and just copy it right out of that. that that'll always be the latest version, that we, the one that we're shipping. Okay. And so now we've, uh, whoops, I didn't copy dbkit, hang on. I thought I did. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's put that. There we go. Okay, great. So now I've got dbkit in here. Now, how do you use it? Well, the first thing you do is just uh, let's go to the app class and we're going to add a property to store the connection. So I'll do db and we'll do uh, dbkit dot table connection. Make that public. Okay, and uh, then we need to connect to it. So I'm gonna add an opening event handler and we'll do db equals new db kit dot table connection and uh, db dot connection equals, in this case, SQLite database one. So we just assign the connection property to the database connection that we've added to the project. And actually, believe it or not, this, this is the only two lines of code I'm gonna actually write in this demo. Uh, and I'm pretty sure I found a way to eliminate those two lines. So I, 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 next time I'll be able to do this demo, I'll be able to do it without writing any code at all, which is my goal here. So now we've got a connection. So now we're going to go to the window and I'm gonna go into the dbkit classes and I'm gonna drag out a table connection. This is the workhorse of dbkit. Uh, you, you assign it a table that you wanna work with. I'm gonna give it customers. And then it does all the work of connecting and, tra and trans transmitting data to and from the database. So now that it's there, uh, I'm gonna go grab a search field So let me make this a little bit wider. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So now I've got a dbkit search field. And after I do a search, I wanna show the uh, results of that search. So I'm gonna drag out a, a uh, control called a query, query rows list box. And let me configure that. So two columns, and I want it to be first name and last name. Oops. Okay, great. And with all the dbkit controls, there's a dbkit section of the inspector. So I'm gonna tell it what columns I want it to uh, display. Oops, first name and last name. Okay. And believe it or not, this should now work. So I'm gonna just do a quick test. Yeah, there it is. So I can search, you know, I, um, I can, 
I've got this part working. I, I haven't written any code to do that, right? That, that dbkit's handling all that for you. So I just made a connection to the database, and already I've got something working without writing any additional code. So let's keep going. So now I want to actually be able to edit, edit uh, records in that. So I'm going to grab a, um, a text field. Okay. And I dragged it right from the navigator, so it's already a dbkit text field. And I'm going to call this uh, first name. And in order to you know, limit the amount of code you have to write, what I've done is I've made it so that if you name the control the same as the column, then it just automatically matches up. You don't have to write any additional code. Now, if you can't do that for some strange reason, maybe, I don't know, the, maybe the database server you're using has characters that aren't acceptable to the IDE, there is a, a dbkit section in the inspector where you can be specific. Right? But by default, you don't have to define that. You don't even have to say what table it's in because it's automatically going to find the table connection and use that table. Right? If you're connecting to multiple tables, then you need to be specific because how can it possibly know? But if you're working with a single table in a layout, you don't need to be specific. Uh, the table connection handles that all for you. All right, so now I'm just going to um, add a few more fields. Let's make this last name and, oops, we'll do address. And oops, let's use this one. Okay. Make this city. And then uh, for the region or state, as we say in the US, um, I want to use a pop-up menu, and with a pop-up menu, oops, oh, okay, there we go. Um, I don't want to. I, I want to populate the pop-up menu from it, from the database. So for pop-up menus, for DBKit pop-up menus, there's an option here, auto-populate, and I can then put. I want that to come from uh, state or states, and I want to populate from the abbreviation column. So that'll automatically create the pop-up menu for me. And let's add the, uh, wait, I gotta make this state or region. And I'm gonna make this postal code. Okay. And last but not least, it supports images as well. So I'll grab the dbkit image viewer and let me Oops, make that a little bigger. Okay. And I'm going to call this photo. Okay. So we've got a bunch of fields on here. Again, I haven't written any additional code. I've just been dragging and dropping. So let's give this a whirl. There it is. Yeah. So without writing any code, I've built an interface to a database, right? Uh, and like I said, I can search and that kind of thing. All right, so that's great, but right now this is all read-only, right? I can't make any changes, so what do we do to be able to make changes? Well, that's actually fairly easy too. Uh, I'm going to grab a dbkit edit button, drag that out. And so that'll let, let me edit and just to make this a little faster, I'm going to bring out an undo button, and I'm going to grab a new record button, and a delete button. Oh. Okay. <coughs> All right. So you see the undo button is already disabled because we haven't made any changes yet. Um, right now, I can't change the record because it's not in edit mode. If I click edit, now it turns into edit mode. I, there's my populated pop-up menu that happened automatically. Uh, I can make a uh, change and the button becomes uh, done. If I press undo, the record's reloaded. All my changes are, are gone. Um, or I can go back to editing. 
And you'll see that if I click done, it automatically updated the list box, right, with my changes. And I didn't write any code, dbkit handled all that for me. Same with new, delete, that, that's all done automatically. So you can see how the, the kind of grunt work of building a front end to a database gets eliminated with dbkit. That's, that's always been the goal. So I wrote two lines of code total for this demo. And like I said in the beginning, I'm pretty sure I can eliminate those two lines. <laughs> so uh, that, that's my goal here. There's more to dbkit as well. Um, for example, you're not always building an interface with, uh, with query results that are on the same layout. And this all works for the web too, by the way. I'm not gonna show the web in, in this demo, but everything you see is exactly the same for the web. Um, but there are other, other ways you can do this, and I'll give you a taste of that. Okay, so this is the actual example that we ship with Zojo, although this is the version on my machine that I'm, it's more up to date than the one you get, but I'll be shipping this version soon. So if you press single, this shows you the interface you just saw, the single record interface. Um, separate, you have a window with your searching, and then you double click, and you have a separate window for the record. And this shows the supporting the toolbar. Those are the icons I copied in earlier, so those are there automatically. And this shows using two tables. So this is the invoices table down here. So if you, if you need to see, well, how would I support more than one table with this? This example shows you how to do it. And then sometimes you don't, you wanna go straight to the records. You don't, there's no list of records you're gonna show. So this example shows that, there's no list. It just went, it did a query, went straight to the record. And this gives me an opportunity to show off some new controls. So I've got first, previous, next, and last buttons uh, and a, a navigation button. Uh, so you just drag them out and they work. You don't have to write any code for these. Uh, you can navigate through the records. They enable and disable properly, right? They handle all that. So literally drag it out, put it on the layout. And I've done this such that if you, with all of the dbkit controls, if you're not specific about a table or a column, then it automatically finds the table connection control on the layout and just assumes that you want that, right? So. You only have to be specific when you're working with multiple tables, because obviously it, it can't figure that out on its own. Haven't quite got that far yet. Working on it, but haven't quite got that far yet. Um, all right, so um, another thing I wanna show is the, the search field at the top is fairly smart. I don't know if you can read it, but you notice it says search uh, ID, comma, first name, comma, last name. So by default, the search field will search whatever columns you've chosen for the query rows list box. It just automatically does that. But there's a, a property in the inspector where you can be specific about what columns you wanna search. So in this example, I've added the ID column, right? Because the ID column doesn't appear in that list. So I added the ID column. Uh, DBKit automatically updates the hint, right? So it shows whatever columns you've specified so the user can see what they're gonna be able to search. And you see this field here, this is the ID. I just threw that on there so we could see it. Well, I've made the search field kind of intelligent. So for example, let's say I only want to see uh, people with an ID above 10,100, right? Well, I can type in a greater than sign and it automatically narrows it to those, right? So these people are all people that have a ID greater than that, or I can say, less than that or equal to that, right? But I can also do a range search. If you type in a, a value and then type three dots, is that three, three, there we go. Now I can go, right? So you can, it, it's smart, it can do less than, greater than, and or a range, you know, between two values, right? So. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's fairly smart about searching. That makes it easier, for, you know, that's something you can teach your users. Hey, you know, use less than, greater than, or, or range, and it'll, it'll do that for you. So that's um, the search field. And I've also been playing around with how to get it to do joins automatically. 
So I'll eventually get to that. So anyway, so that's, that's dbkit, if you haven't seen it before. Um, all part of my goal to make it so that building database applications is easier and you know, less, less grunt work. It, I prefer to focus my time on the really interesting parts of building an application, right? Not, not the, the boring parts. Okay. Uh, let's see. Play. There we go. Okay. So with dbkit, we've improved database connections. Uh, sorry, with Zojo, we've improved database connections. That's coming in a, in a uh, well, probably in R2, probably in the next release. And we continue to update dbkit. Um, it, it's, I call it beta. I really need to just make it shipping. But maybe the next one will be the shipping version. Then I can start incrementing the release numbers from there. All right. Documentation, another thing that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I think a lot of you have been users for more than 10 years. Raise your hands. If, OK, yeah, a lot of you. So when we, when we were shipping uh, Zojo in the early days, of course, you, know, you all remember this, right? Three, you know, spiral bound documentation, a bit thick set of books. Every time we shipped a new version, many of you wanted a new set of the documentation. Our office would fill with FedEx boxes, uh, and we'd go through and you know, we'd order all these documents, and we'd order CDs. Remember CDs? <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, eventually, it became clear that uh, we needed to go to online documentation. And there was a lot of grumbling about us going away from printed documentation. I still have a set of the printed manuals myself in a box somewhere. Um, but online documentation meant that we could update the documentation on the fly. We could you know, correct things, add new information. And most importantly, it was searchable in a way that didn't involve turning pages, right? <laughs> you, know, you could search the paper documentation, but you had to search it by you know, flipping through the pages. So online documentation, we've all adjusted now to having online documentation. We've been through a couple of different engines. Um, you know what the current one looks like. This is the current engine we're using. But I think we've reached, we've reached a turning point now uh, when it comes to documentation and how it's going to present itself going forward in the future. And I don't mean just Zojo. I mean documentation in general, uh, and not just software, but documentation going even beyond software. And what has caused us to reach that turning point is AI. Um, large language models like ChatGBT, and there are many. In fact, Apple announced one yesterday, right? They, they open sourced um, something that they're working on uh, that runs locally on your local hardware, not in the cloud, which is really, really exciting stuff. But these large language models are capable of digesting huge amounts of documentation. Uh, the current documentation for Zojo is over 2,600 pages. Now, we don't all read every page, right? But it can digest that and create a whole new level of experience, a whole different way of accessing the information that is inside those 2,600 pages or whatever documentation you're using. So a project that we're working on is an AI assistant for the documentation. And it actually goes beyond that, too. So I'm going to give you a demo so you can see what this looks like. Now, oops, I'm, um, I'm showing this inside of a window, inside of an, uh, an application. This is talking to, to uh, ChatGPT, but uh, our goal eventually is to integrate it right into the IDE. So we're going to be doing this in steps. So with this, um, I can ask it any question. The, the way to think about it is you're used to you're used to searching through documentation, which means you have to understand the structure of the documentation. You have to understand the verbiage that we use to, to, to refer to things. But let's say you're a brand new user. Maybe you're new to Zojo. Maybe you're new to programming. 
So you don't know the terms. You don't know what like a float is or you know a double or uh, you know a lot of that. You, you just have no idea. You know you don't know what a desktop button is. Those are terms unique to Zojo. So with this, you can ask questions in your own language and have it figure that out. For example, let's say I'm a brand new user, right? Well, I can say um, I want um, a button that that when pressed displays hello world. How, oops, how do I do that, right? That's something a, a beginner would, would, would say because they don't know anything about Sojo, right? So you press that, you in, input that, it's gonna think a bit. Uh, the internet connection here is not super fast, but okay, and there it goes. So it's explaining exactly how you go about doing this, right? Exact steps, keep going, there we go, right? Drag the button out, configure it, add code, here's the code you need to use, here's how you'd use it. And now in this case, it's interesting, it's referring to the action event, and, and obviously it's called pressed, and this is one of those things where you need to think of this as, um, you need to think of it like you have a Zojo expert sitting next to you, and the Zojo expert has been around a long time, and occasionally they'd say action when they meant pressed, right? So, so it does that sometimes. I've literally run this demo myself many times, and sometimes I get action, and sometimes I get pressed. But anyway, this morning it likes action. So I, I think this is actually because, you know in the documentation there's a deprecated section, right? And when we trained the model, it, that deprecated section was in there. So I think we need to remove it and then retrain it so that it won't be referencing stuff like this. But anyway, you can see how it gives you step-by-step -step instructions that you can easily follow. It's an exact answer to your very specific question. Rather than having to dig through documentation to try to figure out, you know, from all these different pages and categories and things what you want to do. Now, that's great for a beginner, but what if you're a more advanced user? So you say, um, I need a method that compares two pictures and tells me if they are the same. Write that, oops, write that for me. Oh, yeah, well, I, I didn't say please, but actually um, it, it, it doesn't need that, as it turns out. So, yeah, yeah, it just does it. It complains occasionally, but mostly does it. So there it is. It's, it's explaining what it's going to do, right? And it's generating the method. And then it tells you how to use the method, and it gives you some notes about, you know, things to think about. And those, those code samples, they have a copy button, so you can just copy the code straight to the clipboard, paste it in. Yeah, so, so there it is, right? So it's, it's like you've got this perfect, um, th this perfect Zojo expert that's just sitting there waiting for you to ask a question. And rather than have a generic example, I can ask for something very specific and get exactly the answer I'm looking for. Uh, here's another example. Um, I, I want a method that accepts a string and writes it out to a file in AES encryption, or using, let's say that, using AES encryption. I've got a faster internet connection at home. <laughs> okay. All right, so there it goes. It's explaining what it's gonna do, and then it creates a step-by-step -step guide, so if you've never worked with encryption, maybe you've never even written data to a file, uh, it's explaining how it's gonna do it, and it starts writing the, the uh, code. Now, this time, let's see, did it use, yeah, it used the crypto module. You can see that in there. It even put try catch in for you. And then it's explaining how to use it.
So this is very useful stuff. Now let's, let's take it to another level. Yes, you're getting a different one. This is, this is a, okay, so here's the thing. If you haven't worked with a large language model, large language models are trained on an enormous set of data, and they don't always know the difference between Zojo and, say, Python. So you can ask it a question. It'll give you an answer. It'll, it'll confidently say that this is Zojo code when, in fact, it's sort of mixed some Python or some C Sharp or whatever because it's trained on a huge data set. The engine I'm using is trained only on Zojo. It doesn't know any other language. So that's why accessing this one is, is, you know, works as well as it does. Um, you've heard of large language models hallucinating. Yeah, that, that's a, a clever word for making errors. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the, uh, my, my code doesn't have any bugs in it. It just occasionally hallucinates. Yeah. Um, and, and you can actually control that. In, in large language models, there's a, a setting called temperature. Again, a very clever word for how much you want it to hallucinate. You know, I think they should call that something like psychedelics. Right? <laughs> um, but anyway, you can say, I don't want you to hallucinate at all. You think of it another way of, another way to say it is sort of like creativity. How creative do you want it to be? Not at all or very creative? Now, if you say very creative, who knows what you're going to get. But you're looking at ChatGPT, but this is a model trained specifically on Zojo that's running on our servers. Right, exactly, exactly. So th whereas this is going to use stuff right from our documentation, it's always going to be the most up to date. So, so let's, let's look at something else. Uh, I'm going to go to one of my projects. I'm going to go to dbkit. And I'm going to look at one of the new methods that I've created. I'm going to go to my search field. And I'm going to go to the search method. OK, so this is the method that, make, that creates the search, right? All of this. And uh, it creates the where clause, and it does all the magic. OK, so I'm going to select this, copy it to the clipboard. And oops, there we go. Here, let me make this a little bigger. OK, and I'm going to say, uh, Please, see, I'm saying please now. Yeah. Just, you know, just in case, right? You, know, you never know. The one thing about large language models is you can ask the same question over and over again, and you won't get exactly the same answer. I don't mean that the other answers won't, will be wrong. It just won't word things the same. It might name things differently. It'll be correct, just as if you asked everybody in this room a simple question how to do a simple thing in Zojo, we would all say it a little differently, but our answers would all be correct, right? Well, that's how large language models work. So please um, review the following <coughs> code and let me know what you think of it. OK, so it's saying, OK, great. Give me some code, and I'll tell you what I think, right? OK, so I'm going to paste the code in. And let's see what it says. Hopefully, it's feeling good about me today, and it's going to be nice. OK, so interestingly, it, it, it has figured out what the code is doing. Your Zojo code is constructing a prepared SQL statement based on dynamic conditions that seem to be complex yet powerful, et cetera. It's, it's kind of saying, oh, yeah, that's pretty interesting. OK. And then it tells me what the strengths are. It's figured out that I'm using like and between greater than and equal to. It's figured out a lot about what this code is doing. And then it gives areas of improvement. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 yeah, it'll tell you where it thinks you might be able to optimize. Or uh, if you don't have try catch, it's going to tell you, eh, maybe you should be doing some error checking in here. Right? Handling of special characters, that, that's a really interesting idea. And for example, I don't think I've seen that before. <laughs> that's, that's the first time that's come up. And then it has some additional suggestions in terms of testing, documentation, and then it gives me a quick little summary saying, yeah, this is pretty interesting stuff. Right? So you can take methods that you've written and ask it to review them, and it'll point out things you just might not have thought of that you should be considering. 
Um, I, I did this with a method once, and it said, what was I using? Oh, I had, um, I had system.debug log in there. No, 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 I'm sorry. I had a, I checked for an error condition, and then I did a message box with the error number or whatever, and uh, it actually said to me, you know, that's not the best way to deal with errors. You know, the end user might not understand how, how you know, just a, a message box with an error. So maybe you want to reconsider. Well, that was only there for me. It, I would never ship that. But it was interesting that it caught that and, and gave me a suggestion about how to deal with it. So an engine like this will make it so that it's easier to write code, easier to check the code that you have. Um, I'd ultimately like to see it where uh, right in the code editor, there'd be a code review button that you could just press, and then it would just pass your method to the engine and then get the summary. Um, same with, <clears throat> same with if you uh, are needed to write something new, you could make an empty method and say, write me a, a method here, and you just type in what you want. It would create it and paste it right into the IDE for you. So initially, it'll probably be just a separate window, but over time, the idea is to integrate it. Now, uh, this is using ChatGPT, but um, the, we're testing several large language model, right? It, it, so we may end up basing on ChatGPT. We might use something else. That's really an implementation detail. That's not anything you need to worry about. But you can use this. Let me switch back to here. You can use AI in your projects. This is something I want you to start thinking about. Um, I ran into a situation where I needed to perform a task in my code, actually in the Docs app. So Docs is an app I wrote that we use internally for managing our documentation. Uh, I showed it at, a, at one of the previous conferences. Uh, this is the interface. Again, this is an internal application. So our documentation is uh, all in uh, restructured text format. That's a, it's a markdown language. And uh, it's categorized pretty much the way you see it in, uh, in the documentation window, right? Uh, there's some extra folders in here that you don't see, but like there's deprecated and data types, database. It's all the same stuff. Files, here's all the, th the pages that are about files. And what I can do is I can select one or more uh, files, and then I can tell to, for example, check the links, right? What used to happen in the old engine of the documentation is one of you would say, hey, this link's broken, and that's how we would know, <laughs> and then we'd fix it. Well, what this does is it, I click check links, and it goes through all 2,600 pages of documentation. It looks at every single link on every single page, validates that that link is still correct. If it's not, then I'll get a list of, of errors of which pages have a bad link and what the bad link was here so I can correct them, right? Uh, and it, but it can do that in 14 seconds, right? Every single link, 2,600 pages, 14 seconds. Um, when Ricardo or Javier, for example, creates a new class and we need to put the uh, documentation into, the into Zojo, I click Create Page, type in the class, and it reaches into the source code, because I have access to the source code. Mm -hmm. uh, it reaches into the source code, and it creates the page template with all the properties, methods, all those tables you see and everything. All I have to do at that point is fill in the descriptions and you know sample code and stuff. But it does the grunt work of creating the page. Uh, when we deprecate something, that deprecate button, Right? I picked the page, not folder item, that's never getting deprecated. Uh, but, but if there was something that was being deprecated, I'd click it, click deprecate, and it does all the work of moving that to the deprecated section, making the, the references back to whatever is the replacement, that sort of thing. Um, I'll skip over the next one for a second. Uh, we have an examples page, it creates that. And every day, or not every day, every release day, right, when we release a new version, we click release day. And that goes in and makes the changes to the documentation to make the, the release that's in beta now the current shipping release. Moves the release notes around and things like that. Okay, so what I needed was I needed a way, I needed to teach the AI assistant how to answer questions. And you think, well, doesn't it know how to answer? No, it doesn't. If you don't teach a large language model how to answer, you'll get very, very short answers. Like, hey, I need to do the following thing, and it gives you like three words, right? So 
It needs to understand how you want it to answer. It needs examples. So the examples need to come in the form of question and answer. So I thought, okay, how am I going to do that? I need to feed it all this data. Oh, wait a minute. I have lots of potential questions in the documentation. If you think about the notes section of a lot of pages, there's a, in the notes section, there's a title and then a description, right? A lot of the pages have notes. And I thought, okay, if I could somehow take those titles and change them into questions, because most of them are not questions, right? Um, then I could take the question and the, basically the answer, and bingo, I've got who knows how many questions and answers. Turns out it's about 1,300, right? So I added a feature to Docs. You see the AI data button there. And when I click that button, it goes and finds every note on every page of the documentation. It takes the title and it passes the title to ChatGPT and says, turn this into a question. Now, imagine what it would be like to write that code. Imagine if, if a client came to you and said, here are you know, a bunch of statements, thousands of statements, right? and you need to make them questions. I need you to write code to turn each statement into a question. Well, you can't just add a question mark to the end. That's not going to work. It's got to start with you know, what, where, who, why, you know, et cetera, right? So that would be pretty complicated. But using ChatGPT, I was able to just say, here's a statement. I need the, que the question out of it. Turn this into a question, right? And I get it back. So, to do that, I created a ChatGPT connection class. Now, we're shipping this example. It's, it's available to you in the current version. If you go into examples and go into AI, uh, you'll find an example that, that does this. And I want to give you a demo so you can see how it works. Because this is something you could absolutely use in your own applications. OK. Uh, all right. So. So this is the actual example right from, from Zojo. And first I'm going to run it so you can just see it running and then we'll, we'll pick it apart. Okay, so I made this just to look like normal, you know, the normal way you would um, access ChatGPT. For example, I can say, um, how many countries are there in the EU? Or 27, okay. List them. Okay, and there they are. I have to say, I don't know about you, but I've been waiting for this kind of AI since I was a teenager. I mean, I was, you know, it's, it's not quite C3PO yet, right? Um, but but it's, a, a, it's a good start. Uh, so then I can say, okay, um, which country has the uh, greatest... Population. Let's see what it says. Okay, Germany. Oh, look at that. That's where we are. Um, how many people live in Germany? Uh, as of 2021, because that's the last time it was trained, probably its data set. 83 million people, roughly. Okay, so, so this is just an example of how to use the class. So let's see what you, how you use it. Okay. It's actually really simple. We'll go to the Send button. Well, I've, I've dragged it out onto the layout. You can see uh, I've got ChatGPT Connection 1. And I'll go to the Send button. And the line of code that really matters, because the rest of it's just formatting, is this one. So you call ChatGPT Connection. And you, the only method you really need to worry about is reply to prompt. So you give it your prompt, which is, in this case, my, my prompt uh, text field. right? And there's a second parameter, which is optional. You can see it true at the end. And that parameter is whether or not you want it to uh, understand context. right? And what do I mean by that? Well, you notice how when I, as I was typing, I could say, how many countries are in the EU? And it gave me a number. And I said, list them. I didn't say list all the countries in the EU. I just said list them. Well, that, that's because it understands the, the context of the conversation. right? So, if you want it to understand context when you're sending a prompt, then you pass true. 
If you don't pass true or if you pass false, which is the default, then it will, it will treat that, that uh, query in its, in, within its own context. It won't consider anything you've said before. As a side note, I was fascinated when I first used ChatGPT. The, the idea that it could, you could talk to it like a human being and you could say things like list them and it just understood the conversation you were already having, to me that seemed like magic. I mean, it's like what you see a magician and they do a trick and it, 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 you know it's not truly magic. You know, it, they're doing some kind of sleight of hand, but it feels like that. Right up to the point where they show you how to do the trick. And most don't, right? In fact, most magicians won't even repeat a, a trick, right? Um, well, the way context works in a large language model, it, it's actually... <laughs> Once you know it works, it feels a little, not, not so uh, technologically amazing. When you tell it to send, uh, or to understand context, and this is true even if you use ChatGPT on the web, not just you know, here. What it does is it sends everything, the entire conversation, right, from, from top to bottom, the entire thing gets sent back to the cloud, and it just processes your entire conversation from the top all the way down to your current query. So that's how it understands context. And if you think about it, that makes sense. Because if they were actually storing data about context on the server, well, how many servers would that take? With millions and millions or potentially billions of people accessing servers, it, I just don't think they could generate that, that amount of hardware. So anyway, so this is how you use it. It's very simple. Um, you can add it to your own projects very easily. Just go to the example, grab the... Uh, the, the uh, where is it? The ChatGPT folder here in the example. Drop it in. There's a there's the ChatGPT connection class, and then there's a um, ChatGPT exception that you want to put in there as well for error handling. But that's about it. And there's a couple of properties you can mostly ignore them. Uh, oops, let's see. So let's see. Yeah. Okay. So um, the important ones if you ever have to worry about it at all, is the model. So in the case of ChatGPT, there are, uh, I think there's two models available right now. There's 3.5 and 4.5 Turbo, or 4.0 Turbo. Anyway, it defaults to ChatGPT 3.5. That's an older version, but, but when you use ChatGPT 3.5, it's practically free. I mean, the cost per, it, it, they, they measure it in like, I don't know, thousands of queries and for like pennies. So it, it's very inexpensive. Now, if you want even better answers, you go to ChatGPT4, but that's an order of magnitude more, or maybe a couple of orders of magnitude more expensive. But over time, what's going to happen is they'll move down. So they'll come out with ChatGPT5, uh, Chat and then 4.5 becomes cheap, right? And that kind of thing. So, but that's where you set the model. Uh, I mentioned temperature before. You can set the temperature. It defaults to the same temperature that ChatGPT does online. Um, it's just a, a numeric value. And how long you want it to wait before it times out. So there's not much you really, all these, the default values are, are probably fine, but if you want to uh, monkey with them, you can. And in order to use the API, you need an API key. So you'll need to go to, to um, OpenAI and go to ChatGPT ask it to create a key. You do need to pay, but you're only paying for usage, not to get the key. And what you'll do is you'll go into constants here and you'll just add your API key to this constant, right, to get it to work. Okay. All right, so that's, um, that's the AI stuff. AI is really fascinating. Um, I, I think it's gonna help us all be more productive programmers and it's going to be able to enable us to add things to our software that would have been extraordinarily expensive to do. Like the simple example I gave you for my Docs app where I just needed to take statements and turn them into questions. That was something very, very simple. Um, and it, did, it, 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 it output 1,300 questions. Now, it's going over the Internet, right? But it takes it about six minutes to do 1,300 questions. So. Um, and then I, we take that file and we feed it into the, our large language model to train it how to answer Zojo questions. So, but again, that's training it how to answer them. It's not the content so much. It's more like 
if you were training someone to teach Zojo, uh, don't, you need to explain a little more, right? It's, it's that kind of training. It's not necessarily training it on the content. The content is the documentation itself. We give it all 2,600 pages of documentation, and it runs through all of that and creates the model. Okay, so now I want to talk about some stuff that's in progress, in addition to all of the things I just mentioned. Um, we're working on privacy settings for iOS. Javier is going to go into this in his session, but basically Apple is now requiring you to explain why your application needs to access things. Is the camera one of those? Uh, yeah, okay. So like things like the camera, anything that could be related to privacy. And uh, Javier is going to show you, but basically the way you would do that on your own is complicated and, and really awful, uh, involved Xcode. And Javier's come up with a great simple um, a simple alternative that will make your life so much easier. Uh, we have a lot of optimizations for web. Ricardo's doing a great job on that. He's going to talk about them in his, set, in his session, but they're actually pretty amazing. I think you're going to be impressed. <clears throat> I mentioned the database connections. I'm pretty sure those are coming in the next release. We'll see. Uh, we're going to be back to working on our grid control. Um, I showed this at a conference before. You know, sometimes we get working on something and priorities start shifting and we've got to move things around and then we just come back to it later. Uh, for example, the database connection stuff I showed you, William started working on that, oh my gosh, 10 years ago. And uh, other things came up that we had to, to do first and so it got pushed aside and now we're bringing it back and getting it done. So that's just how it goes sometimes. We're working on updating the UI for Windows 11. The controls I showed you with the desktop XAML container, that's the modern look and feel. Uh, we're bringing all of that to just the regular Windows framework. This won't require you to touch your code at all. Uh, there'll be a little checkbox in build settings where you can say I want to use the, the new controls, but the API is exactly the same. In fact, it is the same API under the hood. We're just simply telling the Windows framework, in that case, to use the new controls. Um, and for new projects, that, that'll be on by default. For your old projects, when you open them, you'll just check the checkbox. And then for Windows 11, you're going to get the new look and feel. So that's another thing in, in progress. Now, multitasking. Um, right now, in Zojo, you have really two options for multitasking. You have threads, of course, right? Um, but Threads are cooperative, so they're like um, somebody who's juggling, right? If you're juggling, and you're juggling four tennis balls, and I say, great, now juggle five tennis balls, it's still one person doing the juggling, right? So they, they're touching each tennis ball less, right? Because they're juggling five instead of four. So threads are, are good, but they are cooperative. And then you've got the worker class. So the worker class is great because you can do whatever you want, and each worker class instance runs on its own, on, on a different core. So that's like having multiple people doing the juggling, right? So uh, that's great. But for, for small things, for lightweight things, the problem with a worker class is that it's, uh, it's heavy handed, right? It, it's, a, it's a big solution for sometimes what is a small problem. So we realize that we need something in between those. What we need is preemptive threads, right? Preemptive threads can each run on their own core. And we all have computers now that have lots of cores in them, right? They, they, they started, you know, uh, Moore's Law. You've heard of Moore's Law, right? Uh, processor speeds double every 18 months. And then they ran out of, th that didn't turn out to be true, right? Ultimately, it, it started slowing down. So they started adding essentially more CPUs. <laughs> you know, to, to a single chip, and that's what we call cores. Um, so preemptive threads run on, you know, it can, can each run on their own core. So you can fully utilize the, the processing power of your computer. So preemptive threads, how do they work? Well, first of all, they're built into the existing thread class. So this is, a, it's not a new class, it's not new API you have to learn. It's the existing thread class. Um, of course, I, as I said, they can each run on their own core. There's a property called type that we've added. It defaults to cooperative, but you can set it to preemptive. And they can be changed at runtime. 
Now this is really interesting because imagine you've got a, a long method in a thread and it can be cooperative, but the, you have this important section, you know, 10 lines right in the middle, and you'd really like those 10 lines to run preemptively. Well, in your code, you can just have it switch to preemptive right before those lines start and then switch back to cooperative when you're done. So you can, the whole thing can be cooperative, the whole thing can be preemptive, or any portion of a thread method can be one or the other. So you can switch them at runtime. So there's all kinds of interesting possibilities there. Now, they are limited to the non-UI classes. You can't touch anything UI related in a preemptive thread. And the reason for that is that the underlying operating systems uh, Linux, Mac OS, Windows, the code that those engineers wrote, <clears throat> right, at the, that make the operating systems, the code that they write for UI tends to not be thread safe. So if you access the UI stuff, your, pro, your app's probably going to crash because the, the underlying operating system isn't thread safe there. So this is for all the stuff that's not UI related you know, files and mathematics and everything that's just not windows and buttons and that sort of thing. There'll be a limited subset of uh, functions at first that you can use preemptively. Essentially, we're going through the, the um, console framework, essentially, right? That's all the non-UI stuff and making sure that those things are all thread safe. Um, so when we introduce preemptive threads, we'll, in the documentation, we'll give you a list of all the things that you can do. And as long as you stay within that subset, your app's not going to crash. Um, and over time, that list will get bigger and bigger and bigger. So, and there, when you're debugging, it's cooperative, right? So when you're running in the IDE, even if you designate the code to say be preemptive for this thread, it's still gonna be cooperative. They're only, they're only preemptive uh, when you actually run your built app, right? The, the reason for that is complicated, <laughs> but basically the framework has a thread scheduler and once you make the, the thread preemptive, it's outside of that thread scheduler. It's operating on its own and the debugger relies for threads, relies on the scheduler. So it really can't be, maybe someday we'll come up with some magic, but for now, when you're, just remember that when you're debugging, you're doing it cooperatively. Okay. So that's preemptive threads. Now let's talk about sharing code between projects. Uh, what are your options there? Well, good old copy and paste, right? Uh, whether it's code or copying and pasting classes and modules, obviously that's the, the uh, poor man's version of sharing code between projects. And then you have external items. We've all used those, right? And of course we have encrypted items. If you want to give somebody code but not give them, or give somebody functionality but not give them your source code, right? Encrypted items. And of course, plugins that are near and dear to Christian's heart, right? They have plugins. Okay, um, so this is another one of the projects that we started a long time ago and we, uh, are now coming back to it and actually doing the work to get it done. That's why I say it's now in the in progress section of things, and that is libraries. So, what are they? Well, they're a way to reuse code across projects. Uh, they're compiled to machine code. So not, this is not encrypted, this is compiled to machine code. The library does not have your source code in it at all. And they're versioned, meaning that uh, if I build a library, let's say I take a class and I build a library out of it, well, I now have a version of that class that I can put into my other projects. The problem with external items is that let's say you've got an external item and you're using it in 10 different projects, the moment you change it, you've effectively changed it in all 10. And that can be really productive or that can be not so productive, right? Maybe you we're working on one project and you weren't considering that the change you just made is gonna break your nine other projects. So with this, you compile to a library, you take your library and use that in a 
in a particular project and you know you're just using that specific version, all your other projects are using you know, an older version. Um, they can contain any number of project items. So you can drag in you know, layouts like windows and web pages, modules, classes, pictures, anything essentially that can be in a project can be in a library. So you can include everything that you need. And that means they're distributable. So you build a library, now you can distribute it to other people. If you want to make it free, great. If you want to sell it to other Zojo users, you'll be able to do that with a library. How do you use them? Well, just like a plugin, you drop them into the plugins folder, right? But you have another option with libraries, and that is to drop them into your project. So when they're in the plugins folder, they're global, right? But libraries are supported on a project by project basis, so they don't have to be global. So you can use, you don't have to expose a version to every project. You can you just drop it into a project where you're using it. So that's, to me, this is a huge advantage for libraries. Now, how do you make one of these things? Okay, well, here's the navigator for the ChatGPT example I showed you earlier. What you're going to do is go to insert, and you're going to choose library, and you're going to get something that's effectively a folder. This is an actual folder. It's not going to be a folder. It'll have a different icon. But basically, you'll have this folder. You drag things into that folder that you want to be in your library. So I wanted my ChatGPT connection class and my ChatGPT exception, right? <clears throat> drag them in there. Now, when I run, it's just going to run this project, and I can test out my code, and you know, I've got a, a window, for example. I can make sure everything works. But when you build, when you press build, and there's a library object in your project, instead of it building an application, it's going to spit out the library. right? So now you've got the file that you wanted that's compiled the machine code that you can start using in all of your other projects. Uh, yes, you, you, when you hit run, you can debug it. Yeah, it's, com yeah it, it's just like running today. It's really no different than running today. You can put in breakpoints, you can do all that stuff. But, but when you hit run, it's going to run the whole project, right? Um, including when, wherever you call your, your code. When you build, it's going to spit out the library itself rather than the application. So, Okay, so that's how library, that's how you're going to build them. So it's really simple. There's almost nothing to learn, honestly, about how to do it. You make a library object and you drag things in and you hit build. That, that's basically it. Um, and this is how you're going to make Android plugins. So all Android plugins are going to be libraries. Okay? Uh, how many of you worked with Android? Okay, a bunch of you. Now, the underlying framework for Android is, is vastly different than all the other platforms we support. Okay? And the reason for that is that um, the, your application is really in a bytecode when you compile it. Uh, the, the Android device that the user is using, uh, and it depends on the device, either compiles to machine code when the app is installed on the device, or it compiles at the time they first launch the, the application. So you literally could have an app that's not being compiled until the user clicks it the first time. So it's not like any other environment. So providing a plugin SDK doesn't really make sense for Android. So instead, you do it this way. Now, Christian's probably wondering, well, wait a minute, how do I wrap libraries and things like that? Let, let's, say, let's say you've got some library that someone provides. Maybe it's written in C++, who knows what and you want to wrap that in a nice, friendly Zojo API and provide it. Well, you can do that. You can drag that library into your project. You can uh, make declares into it, you know, provide your own wrapper, and then uh, compile it out to a library. So, um, which is actually nice, because you're not dealing with you know, Visual Studio or Xcode or whatever. You just get the library and do all your work right in Zojo. So that's how you're going to make Android plugins. Um, we will continue to be supporting the existing plugin uh, SDK. So if you're building plugins um, for other platforms, you can absolutely do that. But for Android, it's going to only be libraries. And 
uh, is our hope that over time, more and more plugins will actually move to this format? Because, for example, right now, like Christian's plugins, he, you have to put them in the plugins folder and they're available to all of your projects. But if he turns them into libraries, then you can drag them into a project where you're using them and not necessarily have them exposed to every project. So, so there's some advantages there. Okay, so we've got a lot of stuff in progress. Privacy settings, again, Javier's gonna talk about that. Uh, web optimizations, Ricardo will be talking about that. I showed you database connections. We got more updates for dbkit coming all the time. Uh, we'll be uh, bringing our grid control, which you saw if you went to a previous conf conference. Uh, we'll, we'll be getting to work on that, updating our Windows framework. Uh, that, that's a really big job. That, that probably is a early next year kind of thing. Um, that, that's a, a fairly big job. Preemptive threads, though, those will be coming soon, and libraries as well. So you'll probably start seeing libraries in beta maybe at the end of this year or, or later this year, um, and, uh, and we'll go from there. But uh, I'm seeing new work on that every day. It's really looking promising. I'm, I'm really happy with the results. So we've got a lot of stuff in progress. Um, questions? Yeah. Ah, yeah, you know, I forgot to mention that. So, yes, um, depending on what you're doing, we've seen dramatic performance uh, improvements with, and it depends on the platform too, but we've seen dramatic performance improvements using preemptive threads. One of the examples, we were loading pictures from disk into a window, right, a whole series of pictures. And it, it's interesting, so far the tests that we've done, they're roughly five times faster. And it depends on the, the thing you're doing, but it's surprising how many different examples we tried with preemptive threads and e each one of them was a little more or a little less than five times faster than with cooperative threads. So yeah, so it, if you're looking for performance, that's a reason to use preemptive threads. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, yeah, so, so this doesn't change how fast the thread starts up. They start up very, very quickly. So that, that won't be a problem. So yeah, if you have timers, just have your timer create the thread and you're, you're good so to go. It, that hasn't changed. If, if the current plugin supports it, it the, the, the connection stuff I showed you for databases, it's using the existing database plugins. I, that, no, I don't know about that, but, but it's using our built-in plugins. So if they support a feature, then it supports the feature. Yeah, so um, DBKit is all open source. So right now I'm supporting the, the databases that we support, um, MySQL, Postgres, ODBC, and SQLite. But if you wanted to support something we don't support, the source code to DBKit's all there. You could go in. In fact, I've had a few users <laughs> that have found a bug and then told me what to do to fix it in DBKit. Um, so, because they realized, oh, the source code's all there. So yeah, so you could add that, certainly. Um, now, and it, it would, wouldn't be difficult to add it because you can basically search dbkit for like Postgres SQL database or ODBC database and you're gonna find every place in dbkit where it directly references the database and you can just add another case to the select statement, right, and go from there. Okay. Now, if there are behaviors that are different, then that it gets a little more complicated, right? Like for example, Prepared statements with Postgres are a little different than all the others. Uh, the, the symbol that they use, right? They don't use a question mark, for example. So little things like that you might have to deal with, but yeah. Yeah, potentially. And I, I, do, I do have plans to have a um, mobile version of dbkit right now. It's, it's just desktop and uh, web, um, but you know, there's a there's a component to mobile when it comes to databases. If it's local, if it's SQLite, no problem. It's yeah. just like this. But when it's a server, you can't connect to a server and stay connected, right? So 
There's, and I'm, I'm actually working on solving that problem too, but I'm not ready to show that yet. Um, other questions? So we don't support Oracle anymore. Uh, if you want to go to Oracle, you can go through ODBC. Christians has a plugin for Oracle, but we're not directly supporting Oracle anymore. Yeah, yeah so j he's asking, you know, uh, with dbkit, what about doing joins? So uh, you can still do the queries yourself. Uh, the query rows list box, it has a um, query rows property. So you can do it your own query and then just pass your row set to that. So you can do what, really whatever you want. I built the search field just to make, for, for basic queries to make it easier. However, I've been thinking about joins and I'm pretty sure I've come up with a way where I can form a join automatically. Um, essentially what I'm gonna do is if you've been consistent with how you've named your columns, then I'm gonna look at the primary key and then, then I'm gonna start looking at the other tables and say, can I find this column? Like, let's say you've got customers has an ID column. If I find customer ID in another table, I'm going to assume that those that that's the foreign key, so I can build um, I can build a join in code right behind the scenes. You'll always be able to do it yourself, but I'm trying to make it automatic. Um, and then if you haven't quite been so consistent with the naming, I'm going to give you some sort of API where you can say, "Here's the primary key and here's the foreign key," and you just give me that list, and then I know and I can do all the joins for you. Um, I don't think we support views right now. Um, we could. Um, I have a customer that's using it with Postgres, and he was running into a bug, and it turned out he's using schemas in Postgres, right? Where, and I said, well, why are you using those? Because I honestly never heard of anybody using them. Uh, and he said, well, that's how we separate customer data. Whoa, wait a minute. You've got records from different users in the same table, but you're only separating with a schema? That doesn't seem like good security. He said, it's not my database. <laughs> he, he was just having to live with somebody else's database. So I added support for schemas. It wasn't that hard. Um, so views, I could potentially do that too. I just haven't looked into it. Yeah, if you created a view and just said, here they are, you're right. And, and I should look into that. Yeah, um, that, that's a good idea. It, that, I haven't tried that, but it should work. You should, in code, if you want to create instances of controls, uh, dbkit controls, you can absolutely do that. Yeah, but the whole point was to write less code, not more code. So, but, but if you had a need for that, it should work. I, I haven't tried it, but there's no reason that it wouldn't work. Yeah. So, other questions? Good question. That's very much in the uh, in research and development at this point. We're testing various large language models. Uh, we're figuring out, you know, um, like you know, what kind of data to give it. Like we discovered, oh, we're giving it the deprecated section. We probably need to leave that out. So we're we're doing a lot of testing. At some point, we'll make it available for beta testing because we'll want your feedback. Um, we will always have documentation. That's, that's, this isn't gonna replace that uh, because honestly, it feeds on the documentation. It needs to have it. Um, but my feeling is, is that with something like this, the, the, when you know exactly what you're looking for, you probably go to the documentation. But when you're not really sure how to do something, the AI assistant will be great for that, whether it's writing code, helping you with, you know, reviewing your existing code, even debugging. I didn't show that, but I've tested it where I've said, I've got a bug, it's behaving this way, what's causing the bug, right? So there's a lot that you can do with it. And, and in your own applications, too. Start thinking about what could I, what problems could I solve where I could basically call a large language model from my code, right? The user may never even be aware it's there. Right, it's just helping you out. So,
Probably not. The reason is, is that, um, how do I put this? <laughs> so the AI is only going to be as good as the quality of the content. And I know, no disrespect to people on the forum, but, but sometimes when people answer on the forum, the answer isn't complete or it might be wrong in some situations. So we need the content that's being trained on to always be correct. The only way people are going to use it is if they get correct answers, right? It was, if you go to ChatGPT online right now and you ask it questions, you can often get wrong answers. And it's so interesting, I don't know if you've tried this, but it gives you a wrong answer and you say, that's wrong, here's the right answer. And it, it says, oh, I'm so sorry, you're absolutely right. I was wrong, you're right. And it, it just accepts whatever you say as being the truth. Now, yeah, that sounds bad, but it does not incorporate what you, what you just told it into its training set. Training is a large, expensive operation. That's why that answer said, as of 2021, they don't retrain constantly. So that, this is just how they work. Um, if we reach a point where there's a large language model that can look at wrong answers and know that they're wrong and leave them out, then absolutely, I would include other sources. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe, if we could, but of course that's a user saying this is the right answer. So, yeah, we'll see. But, but we can certainly over time include more like the example projects. We might, we might have it go through and export all the code from every example project and feed that into it as well. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, Dash documents. I, I like the Dash document interface. I really do. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, we have offline documentation. If you're not aware of it, all the documentation is available offline too. In fact, it's on your machine. So if you're disconnected from the internet and you say, oh shoot, now I don't have the documentation for Zojo, bring up the help window. It'll say, oh, seems like you're offline. Do you want to install the, uh, the, the offline documentation, which is already on your machine? You didn't know it, but it's already there. And you press a button, it installs it, and now you've got it. So I, I wouldn't want to go to the extra step of creating a wholly different set of documentation. We've already solved this problem, basically. But I, I, do, I do appreciate that you like the interface for Dash Docs. I, I like it too. Um, the interface that's, that we use in the Zojo documentation is provided by the engine that we're using. So, by the way, we, we made a recent change to that. Um, it, the, the engine that we're using for doing the searching the documentation, I think last week we, we changed it behind the scenes. So you may find that it's a little more Google-like. Yeah, well, now we'll do that with the AI assistant. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see. Yeah, but we're always looking to improve things. Anything else? Because I know we're at our coffee break. Well, last question. So it involves um, killing a rat and pouring its blood over the computer and... Yeah, no, it, it's... Um, yeah, what we've discovered is that a lot of, you know, the, the code gets maintained and improved over time, the underlying framework. And uh, about, I don't know, a year ago, William started um, experimenting with preemptive threads, and he came to find out, oh, you know, the console framework is actually, you know, it's fairly thread safe at this point. Uh, it's not all thread safe, <laughs> but, it's, but it's fairly thread safe. So, so we realized that it was probably, actually, because of the performance improvements, right, it was probably reasonable to make them available to you and then to start auditing the code and finding where it's not thread safe and we're making changes. Like right now, on the Mac, our strings are using some ancient API. I mean, I'm surprised that it still works. But we need to upgrade that for strings to work on the Mac. Um, 
And you'll, you will see performance differences on different platforms. Like the example I gave of loading pictures, on Windows, five times improvement in performance. On Mac, it's not much of an improvement at all. Um, it's just the operating system's different. So your, your mileage may vary on, on that. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate everybody coming here. Um, I appreciate you using Zojo. Uh, I think I can speak for everybody at Zojo and say that we, we really love our jobs, and you make that possible. Right? Without you, we couldn't be doing what we're doing. And so keep using Zojo, and, and I'll be here for the whole conference. If you have other questions, feel free to grab me and, and ask me. But thank you so much. Thank you.